This is episode 54 of the Immunology Podcast, Innate and Mucosal Immunity with Dr. Bana Jabri. Hey everyone, this is Dr. Jason Goldsmith and Dr. Brenda Rout. Welcome back to the Immunology Podcast, where we have conversations with immunologists. The Immunology Podcast is brought to you by Stem Cell Technologies, a global biotechnology company supporting life science research and fostering communication and collaboration in science. If you enjoy the Immunology Podcast, rate us and leave us a review. We're always looking for feedback on how the podcast can be improved and for suggestions on guests. Today, we have Dr. Bada Jabri from the University of Chicago on the podcast to talk about her research and interplay of the immune system and mucosal surfaces, which, as you can guess, has me very excited. We've also got our usual roundup of recent highlights in immunology news coming up. But first, Stem Cell Technologies would like to introduce you to Immune Regulation News, a free weekly newsletter brought to you by the Stem Cell Science News Program, covering research on the regulation, suppression, and modulation of the immune system. Immune Regulation News keeps readers current with the latest news, research, policy, events, and jobs relevant to the immunology community. Subscribe for free at www.immuneregulationnews.com. Jason, good to see you again. Good to see you. It's been, what, two days? Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> After five awesome days at AAI. Get used to seeing you. I'm finally, I'm finally home after another conference after AAI. Got to mm -hmm. sleep in my own bed. That was exciting. See my children. They still remember me. That was good. Kudos to Jason for sticking out uh, for that long. And now he has some deserved family time. And I'm in Boston. So I'm still in the U.S. I stayed behind for a couple of days. That's very exciting, actually. I mean, it's ironic that just the one time I'm not in Boston. But that's okay. I know. Too bad. Well, next time. There will next be next time. time. I mean, next year, Chicago is also close to Boston, kind of. So Yeah, we'll get her walking in. I, when I was just at Chicago for the conference before AI, I did six miles a day, which, you know, is like pretty good. 10 kilometers or something. 10 kilometers. Yeah, so that's what pretty good. Yeah, I was getting all, well, congrats. Getting all fit. All right. Well, let's dive into this because I think uh, yes. we should just do that. So I'm going to actually present something that I saw the abstract of and a presentation of at Digestive Disease Week a few weeks ago. And mm -hmm. then they put out the paper, they time this, right? So you can't, you, mm. you can't present data that has been published. And so then this oh. came out the week after with the paper. In nature, we have profiling the human intestinal environment under physiological conditions. Uh, first authors are Derry Shalone and Rebecca Culver. And Jessica A. Grembley and Jacob Fultz and David Relman and Kerwin Casey Huang are all equally contributed, our first and last author. So um, came out in Nature May 10th. DW ended May 9th. Accident? I think not. So this is a really cool technology paper. Usually when we sample the microbiome at stool, right, or you can go in with an endoscope and try to get something, but you can't get to the middle parts of the gut very easily or very safely. Well, they came up with capsules. and that, So capsules exist that will dissolve based on pH or with release into different parts of the intestine. That's known technology you can get for pharmaceuticals. But they created a bladder, that a one-way bladder that after the capsule, like your pill, dissolves, this capsule opens up and fills with luminal contents, about 100 microliters in whatever area it opens up in. And from this, they were able to sample the entire gut, measure the microbiome and metabolites there, and do a bunch of cool stuff. So basically, A, they show this works. They show that the different parts of the intestine have different populations, and that what you capture in the stool does not match what you think is cap what is captured earlier on, right? It's a concentration gradient. So things have niches in different spots. Microbial counts increase all the time. So they show all of that. They do a big tour to force showing demonstrating this they show that you can culture the bugs afterwards they show you can store it and then culture it so you do some you know technical validation as well then they go and look at different metabolites and we know that the gut metabolizes things in different parts and so they do looking at sugars and amino acids and all of that and that's really neat and then they do bile acids which is where i'm going to spend just a quick moment talking about so bile acids are really important about gut for gut homeostasis, if they're perturbed, can be let open to infections because essentially, if you really simplify it down, secondary bile acids are good because they protect you and primary acid, bile acid shifts bad. So too many primary bile acids later on allow opportunistic infections to go. They're metabolized. There's only a few bile acids that we really appreciate 
in stool. But if you kind of look at theoretical conjugation and what they could conjugate to, which are all the other amino acids and stuff, there's like 20 or 30 of them. And now with some more sensitive techniques, they've seen a little bit of these in stool, but they can basically find almost all of them by sampling further up. So they're showing that they have conjugations earlier on in the alimentary canal. And then there's metabolite, metabolism by the bacteria and deconjugation and reconjugation, other things later on. So they basically found some of the missing bile acids or the theoretical ones by sampling further upstream before other bugs can get to them. So that was really neat as well. So this is one of those papers you got to really read to get all the inference information, but they look at different enzymes, antibiotic resistance, see where those genes are harboring in different spots. And they really do a tour de force of you know, mouth all the way to rectal um, sampling and really demonstrate what you can get and compare it to stool within people. They also interestingly had someone accidentally take antibiotics off protocol. And so that showed that it became a really interesting story because they had two people who had different population shifts than everyone else. So they can see that even though they had antibiotics about a month ago, these shifts in communities and the fact that it's much more homogeneous throughout and then they looked at antimicrobial microbe resistance genes as well and found uh, where the bugs tend to reside for that too. And that E. coli and Shigella species are large reserves and those are actually further up. So by the time you get to the colon, there's less E. coli. E. coli is there, obviously, there's more bugs. There's a lot of it. But as a percent, it's actually higher earlier on. So really cool paper, really cool technology, getting into spots you couldn't get into before, exciting stuff. I like it. It's an intestine detective. Yes, it is. Plumbing the depths, as it were. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's so important, right? Because unlike mice, you cannot open up and uh, isolate the small intestine of a person. So you need to know what's going on there. And I never thought about the kind of mechanical um, difficulties of getting all the way up there. Yeah, there's a double balloon endoscopy, but it's pretty risky. Hmm. All right. Okay. So do you think it's going to like new things? How much more do you think we can learn using that, that particular? Oh, quite a bit. You're going to start isolating species and growing them out. That alone will take years. Okay. You know, what the bile acids do, what the metabolism do, so on and so forth. Other metabolites do a lot. Exciting times. Exciting times. Okay. So I'm also going to discuss a paper that takes a couple of reads to to get through, but it's a very interesting paper. It's called Recruitment of Epitope-Specific T-Cell Clones with a Low Avidity Threshold Supports Efficacy Against Mutational Escape Upon Reinfection. It was published in Immunity, and the first also author is Adrian Straub, and the last authors are Christian, uh, sorry, Kilian Schover from Erlangen and uh, Dirk Bush from the Technical University of Munich. And I really like, I, I think I've already discussed some papers from, from these authors. I, I really like their work. They 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 really try to understand the if the influence of T, of the TCR and the kind of affinities that a TCR has to the how it programs like how to affect the effector function of a T cell. Because I guess that unless you're a T cell um buff, you don't really think a lot about it. It's not only about a T cell being able to recognize an antigen, but it's also about how strong this recognition is and how, and this does have important downstream effects on how the, the T cell will react to um, being presented uh, its uh, cognitive antigen. And also the fact that there is some wiggle room in what a T TCR recognizes. There's some level of promiscuity and things like this. So it's, it's definitely not a black and white situation with TCR as much as sometimes we tend to think it like that. And also because historically the way that we looked into reactive TCRs has been focusing on those very strong uh, TCRs that have very high affinity and then they're easy to quote unquote, um, easy to recognize because usually we are looking into the high affinity and, and we tend to not understand what's what's the deal with the one the TCRs that recognize their antigen with lower affinity uh, or lower avidity and how whether this response is also important to sustain a kind of a proper immune response. So in this paper, basically what they do is that they look at, you know, they find, they try to simplify and they look into a target to a model antigen. Uh, in this case, and unsurprisingly, they go into the symphecal uh, uh, peptide derived from uh, ovalbumin. And 
they uh, tried to look into understand how T cells, mouse T cells, recognize this antigen and what what is the the breadth of the repertoire of TCRs that are against this antigen. So basically, they start very easy experiment, infect mice with uh, a listeria, listeria monocytogenes that are expressing that is expressing ova, and they look into T cells that are. Uh, after this response, they look into tetramer positive cells. So they use tetramer to identify the T cells and pick them up from, from this repertoire. And of course, they identify multiple clonotypes uh, in total from 40 mice. They identify more than a thousand different clonotypes. And there is, you know, about tw uh, 20 to 40 clonotypes per mouse. And they show that it's about usually two or three clonotypes are dominating the immune response. So although they, they detect a lot of tetramer specific cells in the end, when it comes to the percentages or like the predominance of each clone, it's about two or three. And this is something that we know. Um, but it's nice because they are using now, they're, they're really trying to make a very clean, very good system to really follow these responses. So they, they try to understand what is the, the, the what the deal was. You have two or three clonotypes, which are like less, usually less than ten percent of these of the clonotypes are of high affinity, but you still have all these other clonotypes that are being that are there, but what are what is their function? What are they doing? So this they, they they go back a, a notch and they try to look into the the transition between the naive to the effector kind of repertoire. And they do they do something that I, I didn't think was possible, but I guess it's quite quite cool, is that they look into um synthetical reactive T cells from naive black six mice. And this is very hard because usually these precursors are gonna be found. You know, maybe if you have 20 to 40 clones per mouse, you're gonna have hopefully, you know, a couple hundred precursors in the whole mouse. And so they 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 basically take tons of of, of mice. And they just run the whole spleen and the whole lymph node uh, cells from the, the all of the mouse, trying to find these reactive, uh, um, synthetical reactive T cells. And that means that you need to basically screen a lot of cells. And they do something that is called speed enrichment, which maybe our listener, some listener might find it useful. I didn't know this was uh, something that people did, in which in, they use they stain the cells with these attached tumors against the against the synthetical and basically they use instead of triggering the sorter for um using uh, this this the force scatter so like the size you should have a force scatter tr um, threshold to trigger the 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 um, the sorter to look into the event to see if it was going to sort it or not they changed that for using a threshold of fluorescence on the channel of the tetramer and apparently this allows them to do the sorting a lot faster. Um, I'm not sure how that works, but it, I, I, I assume that then there's less of for the for the sorter to kind of process, and maybe that makes it better at at, at triggering the right uh, for the person's positive cells because in the end, most of the cells that go through that they are negative because there's the the precursors are going to be very rare. But apparently, this really allow them to uh, sort or kind of pre-sort the tetra positive population at very high speed. So now you know for those who are desperate to reduce their time and disorder for this kind of things. And I guess it only works if you have very, very few uh, expected positive events. In any case, what they do with this, and I thought it also was very interesting, basically, once they have this repertoire, they they clone it into into vector and viral vectors. So they they do single, like single wells for each for each TCR. And then they clone it into viral vectors, and then they generate retroviral mice, retro, uh, retro, retrogenic mice, in which they are transducing uh, hemo hematopoietic stem cells from Rag1 negative Rag1 knockout mice, and then they they regenerate uh, with the make bone marrow chimeras. So they what they end up is uh, with a mouse that has a naive population of T cells that are these trans these TCRs, which these TCRs that you transduce in the bone marrow. And this is cool because then it allows you to study all of these uh, different, so they, they, all these different TCRs that you pre-selected, but on the na on a naive background. And really under is then if you're looking to how is the recruitment depends on the different TCRs, this is the best way of doing it. So also I think very 
very interesting, but it must, must have been a very uh, time consuming, very laborious um, system to take to work with. But basically, I use this in order to understand, like, well, we have this, this all these uh, tetramer positive cells that we identified from the naive repertoire. What happens if we we barcode them and we put them into into these mice, and then we see what happens when we activate them? And they showed that actually many of these TCRs that they picked up with barcodes are not actually specific. They're actually not responding to antigen. Also interesting. They, it's not clear to me whether this is a misbinding of the tetramers, a mislabeling who has something to do that they're actually recognizing the peptide by not responding. It wasn't completely clear to me. But basically, again, the, the conclusion, which I know sounds very logical, but this is a very good experimental way of showing that from this whole repertoire, they only find, so in this case, they, they have 18, 19 different uh, TCRs. Only two of them are of high ability, and they really dominate the immune response. And I want to just to they just to kind of wrap out the last of the because they they have this is a very um, very extensive paper, but they show also that then why are these low avidity what are these low avidity TCRs doing? And then they show that in the case of mutated epitopes, if they have like slightly mutated versions of the same fecal peptide, some of these low avidity TCRs that I mean they are kind of recognizing same fecal, but they're not obviously not important for that particular immune response so why are they why would we what is is there any advantage of like expanding them a little bit just keeping them there and they show that the presence of these low avidity uh, tcrs protects the mice from slightly mutated version of the synfecal peptide and that if if you uh and then having these options provides kind of a, an extra layer of of protection in case of uh mutated uh, mutated antigens where maybe you have a very strong immune response and then you escape by mutating the antigen having related but uh, not completely identical TCRs that are kind of reactive might give you an extra edge against slightly mutated uh, slightly mutated versions of the antigen uh, from the primary response so built in built in backup for antigenic drift yeah exactly that's that's kind of the idea. And so they, in their model, if you don't have these other TCRs, if they have an, an antigenic response, even if you have some level of cross-reactivity between the original TCR, it's not enough. Having this other TCR kind of waiting there in, 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 in the background really is the difference between mounting a proper immune response against this either variant or not. Um, so it's a very interesting paper. I, I like, again, it's good to read many times because the systems, I think, are so elegant that they can also be applied for other questions. Um, so very uh, recommended reading uh, from me. Well, I got one more, also a microbiome one, because we're, you know, talking to Dr. Bonajabri later today. And why not keep on the theme? This one is widespread extinctions of co-diversified primate gut bacterial symbionts from humans. First author is John G. Sanders. Last author is Andrew H. Moeller. It is a micro or nature microbiology, it came out on the 11th of May. So they went, and this group went and got uh, microbiome samples for a bunch of wild primates, and then looked at genetic drift and species over time there, and overlaid that with microbiome data from people, and looked at what we had and what we've lost, and what's changed and everything else. And so very clearly, the microbiome has co-evolved with humans over time, um, you can see that you can see that as you can see metabolic functions change as the species change. So as we are able to metabolize things differently, the microbial niche to support that or how that relationship works, because sometimes what we metabolize and eat first gets eaten by bugs to make it something we can use. You'll see those shifts over time, which has to do with dietary source and what our enterocytes and everything else can do. So they were able to see those shifts. And they also see that we've actually lost some species from them over time. And then particularly, there's a set of symbionts that we've lost that really correlate with industrialization. So less industrialized societies maintain some of these bacteria, but we're losing them in industrialized societies in particular. But that's not always the case. And sometimes it's just being human means you don't need this specific species anymore. But what's kind of cool about this is more the technical ability to line these up, get the open reading frames together, 
understand about the bacteria in these different groups to make sure they're the same or if they're different, how the each bacteria is antigenically drifted from each other or not antigenically, but you know, genetically drifted, right? So you have to have genetic drift in every strain and compare that bug to the bug on the tree of life and then the human tree on life and see how they concordance with each other. So they have like concordant space to measure how far away on phylogeny you are and then genetically as well and see how much they line up. So there's a lot of actually pretty, not super necessary like, complicated math in terms of weird formulas but complicated math instead of terms of computing and be able to generate these distances and generate understanding from it and cleaning up all the data but there you know their big point is actually there is um you know there's some genomes that very specifically have positive pressure over time and other genomes that specifically have had negative pressure and most importantly we've actually the lot there is a subset that doesn't just lose diversity in humans but loses diversity and presence in industrialized societies that less industrialized societies still have and so it's interesting that that thread is still contained but in terms of like really understanding this co-set of organisms that grow within us and how that relates to our ancestry and seeing the patterns that have persisted over time like like this situation has been going on for a long time in human evolution in terms of having a microbiome that's truly a symbiotic relationship with us and this really goes and establishes that that looks all the way down at whole genome sequencing for what these bugs do and their metabolites and they can track differences over time there's not a lot of mechanism here but there's a lot of just general knowledge and understanding that comes from this paper and i thought that was really neat all right i mean it's important to have Knowledge and understanding, that's such, a, that's such an overstatement, understatement, sorry. All right, just to conclude today, I think it's a fairly short story, but I, I just wanted to um, highlight it because every every kind of successful story of a clinical trial, I think, is worth sharing, uh, especially if it's against some cancer types that are particularly aggressive. So um, the paper I'm, uh, I want to present now is called Personalized RNA Neoantigen Vaccines Stimulate T-Cells in Pancreatic Cancer. And the first authors are Luis Rojas and, um, and Zachary Sethna from Memorial Slow Catering uh, Cancer Center in New York. Uh, first, uh, last author, Vinod Balshandran. Um, and this is the kind of... of report from a clinical trial using, as the title suggests, uh, neovac neoantigen vaccination uh, in uh, pancreatic cancer. So in particular in pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma, PDAC, which is very lethal. Um, and it has been often regarded as not being a good target for immunotherapy, but it has had been has been suggested that he had a kind of low mutational burden and was not sufficient. But in this paper, they show that they can actually identify enough new antigens uh, from these patients to generate uh, new antigen vaccines that seem to be effective for many of these uh, of the people in the in, in the trial. So basically, they have a phase one uh, trial. They first treat the patients. They remove the tumor. And they treat the patients with anti pd one therapy. And then uh, they also administer uh, eight doses of a, a, a mRNA vaccination that has a lipid uh, mRNA and a lipid complex. And then uh, they they follow the they follow up afterwards with uh, several sessions of chemotherapy. And that is basically the design of their clinical trial. And in the end, they ended up having 16 patients that went underwent the whole protocol. And, and I think it's very, very um, remarkable that half of those patients had a really strong response. Uh, and they had a very strong um, immunized activation, but mostly they had a large reduction in their tumor. Um, so I think that uh, from this, so we have um of the they had uh, 18 month free survival uh so from the six so they 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 treated uh 16 patients with the with the pdl1 and the vaccine and then 15 patients with the uh chemotherapy um and the they had 
they could really identify high uh, magnitude of neonatal specific T cells in these eight responding patients, and um, and they they did a lot of they, they they looked into you know the the T the T cell repertoires and they showed that up to ten uh, percent of of the, all the blood in these of these patients was uh, specific against these new antigens that they picked up and that they are they prime the patients against. And so the 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 patients, so if you see look at the at the the plot of the of survival, it's is very it's very impressive. They are all they all survived, have a really good response after after all this time. And I think it's very very impressive because this is a very is an is known to be a very uh difficult cancer that most most of the time um uh, recurs in in these patients they looked into um the the clones they could identify clones against all these new many of these new antigens that they that they selected and i think there's also one case in which they show that for one of the patients was a micrometastasis that actually was was interesting because after the treatment they saw like the occurrence of one extra um a metastasis and um and in in the liver or they they see a lesion in the liver and it turns out that that lesion was when they did a biopsy of that of that lesion was mostly just uh not really malignant cells but mostly lymphoid cells and then after in the next round of of, of scans they saw that that was gone so it was it was a metastasis that they didn't even know was there but then it was kind of attacked by the t cells that were primed somewhere else but uh, in any case, I think it's very, very interesting because they do show that they can do this regimen and that there was a substantial response in 50% of the patients and that these T cells were durable and they persisted for at least two years of the, of the follow-up, which I think is very, is very, um, very encouraging. And that, well, you can, this is a very valid um, treatment option for, for, uh, for this particular patient so on, in, a, in a cancer type or pancreatic ductal adenocarcinoma that usually uh, was not very well served by immunotherapy. Yeah, no, anything would be better than what we have currently, basically. Right? Yeah, so this is awesome. And also, I think it's nice because it only took them nine weeks to individualize. So we, from the, they do their, their, their production uh, time is nine weeks, which is really good, I think. It's very quick. So that is all right. Well, we could keep talking as we everyone knows, but we're going to be speaking here with Dr. Bana Jabri at the University of Chicago in just a moment. But as of course, before we get to that, are you looking for a quick reference so you can hang on your lab wall or your bedroom or your bathroom, wherever you get your thinking done? Stem Cell Technologies has various wall charts covering different immunology topics, including a snapshot of COVID-19, an overview of antigen processing and presentation, and more. Explore all the immunology wall charts and order your free copy at stemcell.com slash immunology wall chart. Hi, everyone. Uh, today, we are joined by Dr. Bana Javri. She is the Sarah and Harold Lincoln Thompson Professor in the Department of Medicine and Research Director of the Celiac Disease Center at the University of Chicago. She is going to talk to us about her research, basically on all things IBD, celiac disease, Jason, you're going to have so much fun today. This is special for you. Professor uh, Javri, thank you so much for joining us. It's a great pleasure to be with you today. I'm winning. What can I say? It's been it's been a good week for me. So to start, I'll start with celiac disease, which which is a, an important one. It's not my love of IBD, but still very important. I think people think of it as an allergy to gluten. I think people know that you can develop antibodies to gluten if they know what antibodies are. And those cross react to your body. So that kind of is known, but there's obviously a lot more that goes on. Otherwise, you wouldn't be still studying celiac disease. So could you talk about to start with that next level of information in terms of mucosal immunology with celiac disease beyond this very simple simplistic wheat allergy, gluten antibody bad type of scenario that's happening, including like why the heck do we people get it if gluten is such a common protein we're all eating all the time so we should all have oral tolerance to it you know naively right 
Yeah, so f first of all, uh, thank you for the question because it's uh, certainly a, a very important question. So uh, the first thing I would like to do is separate very clearly what people call wheat allergy from celiac disease. Uh, so uh, many people know about food allergy uh, and food allergies are uh, really defined by something that is very different from celiac disease because in food allergies, uh, you rarely actually, uh, and I'm going to oversimplify, I'm going to take the IgE-mediated food allergies and contrast them to celiac disease. So IgE-mediated wheat allergy to celiac disease. So in, in IgE uh, food allergy, what you're having is no tissue destruction but you have antibodies, IgE antibodies, that are going to bind to innate cells like mast cells, and they are going to induce degranulation of histamines and many mediators that are going to induce a very acute reaction that can even be life-threatening. In celiac disease, it resembles much more type 1 diabetes or other organ-specific autoimmune disorders, where the end result is this tissue destruction. So it's a very, very different type of immune response. You could almost say wheat IgE allergy is like the immune response we mount against helminths, and celiac disease is more the kind of immune response you mount in the context of viral infection. So I would compare celiac disease much more to a complex organ-specific autoimmune disorder like type 1 diabetes. And so then the question uh, becomes, you know, as you said, why do we develop? First of all, why do certain people develop, let's say, allergy to wheat and other develop celiac disease? Because this is a completely different type of immune response. And then the second question is, why do we even develop dysregulated immune responses to wheat? In any case, these are complex disorders. So what people mean by that is that you you, they are involving many different types of genes. In the context of celiac disease, there's a very dominant gene, which is the HLA, DQ2, or DQA gene. But you involve many, many other genes because, as you said, 30% of the population is HLA, DQ2, or DQ8, and only 1% develop celiac disease. So having you know, the, one of the key genes is not even enough to uh, develop celiac disease. And so this enters really the realm of complex disorders where you really need a combination of environmental factors, of many other genes interacting with the mean and the, the, the main key core genes. And, uh, and, and uh, I would say probably also some stochastic events. So uh, if I can give you as an example, uh, viral infections, which my lab has worked on. Uh, people have invoked rotavirus infections, enteroviral infection. However, the timing of the viral infection seems to be very important. It should probably happen around the time of introduction of gluten. Then, even within the same family of viruses, only very few viruses will do it because there are many checkpoints in our body that are going to prevent dysregulated immune responses, be it autoreactive immune responses or dysregulated immune responses to dietary antigens. So, for instance, what we have now found, and, and, and this is a paper under consideration right now, is that the same antigen presenting cell that presents gluten peptides has to receive signals from dying epithelial cells and has to incorporate epithelial cells that have the viral uh, infected, uh, that is infected by the virus. And you have to have a combination of events that then lead to a combination of signals that then is going to induce this dysregulated immune response. So when you look at all the checkpoints that are necessary, you, you come to the conclusion that in order to actually even mount a dysregulated immune response, you need a combination of events that are not frequent. And then our body has a number of regulatory mechanisms. So let's say even if you have in response to a virus mounted a inflammatory immune response against gluten, this immune response, if there's, there are no other events, may not be long lasting. And you will need other events amplifying again this uh, pathogenic pool until it reaches a certain level. And, and then you need, uh, we know already, a combination of other events in epithelial cells 
that are like stress events in the epithelial cells. And then only when you combine everything will you have uh, really uh, over celiac disease. So uh, the, the way we need to think about it is there is an endpoint, but in order to reach that endpoint, there have to be a number of coordinated events that happen. And probably we need multiple hits. So I, I believe that many people who have celiac disease or organ-specific autoimmune disorders that start, let's say, at the age of 20 or 40, have had events in the past that have accumulated but didn't translate into uh, overt disease. So it's this the idea that, like, you, you're not going to get celiac disease from wheat, and I, I'm oversimplifying here, but if you get food poisoning at your local restaurant, while eating a bunch of breadsticks, that double insult from the rotavirus or the norovirus or whatever, plus the fact that gluten is there, that antigenic crosstalk and multi-hit signaling, that, that's an incident. It may not give you celiacs the first time, but it's, it's, it's multiple ones of those where it's these twofer events that that's what can then drive developing this pathogenic response. Exactly. But uh, but even now we know that in order to get tissue destruction, it's not even enough to have a dysregulated immune response against gluten. It has to synergize with stress signals coming from the epithelium. So you have what we call potential celiac disease, which are patients that have, for example, anti-transcutaminase antibodies, but they don't have tissue destruction. And that's because they are missing some key events in the epithelial cells that need to coordinate with the signals of the adaptive immune system. So, you know, and, and if you think about it, it's normal, right? We, we need many, many checkpoints. If not, we, there would be so many occasions for us to develop uh, many diseases. So we do have a lot of checkpoints uh, within our immune system uh, that prevent this dysregulated uh, immune uh, responses. And, and 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 pathology. Yeah, but I guess that eventually you run out of luck, and the insults uh, pile up on each other. I have a question. I'm very fond of of T cells in general. So, when you're talking about uh, HLA DQ8 as being a, a, a kind of a um, uh, it's a source of um, genetically genetical susceptibility to celiacs, is this because is there any particular peptide that is presented by this particular isoform? How does that work? Yeah, this is, again, such an important question. And uh, I would say we are starting to better understand why, but uh, it's, there's still a lot that remains to be fully understood. So first of all, uh, I think one thing that should be said is that gluten peptides can bind many, many types of uh, MHC molecules. And that's why you can see people having IgA anti-gluten antibodies. Uh, I'm sure that Jason knows that even in IBD patients. That's why one says this is not a diagnosis for celiac disease. So having a reaction against gluten doesn't involve at all being HLA DQ2 or DQ8. And you can take any mouse strain and immunize it with gluten. And uh, if you do it, you can see an immune response mounted. So it means that uh, any uh, MHC molecule can bind the gluten peptide. So then the question becomes really why it's a DQ2 and DQ8. And I think this goes back to this perfect storm idea, which is that in the intestinal mucosa, you have an enzyme called transglutaminase. And this enzyme has a, a, a gluten is a substrate for this enzyme. And what this enzyme, uh, uh, what happens when this enzyme sees gluten is that it changes glutamines into glutamates. So it introduces negative charges in gluten. And it turns out that both DQ2 and DQ8 have positively charged packets. So now you are creating a peptide that is of way higher affinity for the predisposing HLA molecule. At the same time, uh, when you mount an immune response against uh, non diamidated gluten peptides, meaning the peptides that don't have that negative charge, you are going to attract certain T cells. When you are going then to change the peptides because you, you introduce these negative charges, you are going to 
attract another series of T cells. And so what we think is happening and what the requirements may be is that you have to have HLA molecules that allow for this amplification of the immune response, where you can gather the maximum number of T cells so that you can, it's almost as if, you know, each of us can mount a dysregulated immune response, but if it doesn't reach a certain threshold, we will not develop pathology. And what those predisposing HLA molecules allow to do is in the context of a given tissue, in the context of given post-translational modifications, like the ones we see with transcutaminase, you can amplify the immune response and recruit uh, a, 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 a quantitatively a, a number of T cells that then become pathogenic. And to support that idea, we know that if you have double dose of DQ2, you are much more uh, inclined to develop celiac disease than when you only have one uh, uh, DQ2 molecule. DQ8 molecules bind less gluten peptides than DQ2 molecules because DQ2 molecules have pockets that can accommodate more easily prolines, and there are a lot of prolines in gluten, and people who have DQ2 uh, uh, molecules ha have a higher risk than DQ8. So one sees that there's a quantitative aspect to uh, the risk of developing celiac disease, which is related to the number of T cells that you can recruit. I'm fascinated. When we start understanding the identity of the culprits and how we read that information, like how our T cells misreads this information. I just, this thing is fascinating because I I don't think I think enough of uh, celiac disease or other similar diseases as, yeah, so important as like, where exactly is the issue? What is the peptide is doing this? How are we finding, how are we identifying that peptide and misreading what it means? Uh, super interesting. And I know Jason has a lot of, questions to continue your conversation so to go on with this a little bit before i get to my microbiome question how how would you treat this then or or is there two well two parts maybe you want to prevent celiac disease i don't know if there's a way right like avoiding rotavirus and norovirus i mean to an extent the toilet and sanitation systems are what does that for us right and, or, and vaccines and vaccines mm -hmm. um so does, I guess I'll, I'll start there. So A, does vaccination, you know, there's two ways vaccination goes. One is that it just attenuates the disease, but you could still get the response. So do you think vaccination is a viable means by which you attenuate the response so you don't get this double hit effect? And then two, beyond vaccines, how would you, knowing what we know now, go about treating celiac disease that doesn't mean you have a life free of bread? Because that's sad. Yeah. So uh, first, I think in terms of prevention, that goes to all complex immune disorders. You know, what is it in our Western world that increases our risk of developing complex immune disorders? And I believe there's certainly a diet component, because if, if you take China, for instance, uh, it's very clear that the frequency of inflammatory bowel disease, of type 1 diabetes, and even celiac disease has significantly increased uh, since there were major changes in diet in China. And, and they are starting to see diseases at a frequency they were not seeing before. So uh, we also believe, and you know, there's evidence for that, that if you have uh, early antibiotic treatment in childhood and too many antibiotics, that can also uh, alter your immune system. So there is something about our Western culture that somehow uh, enables our immune system to respond to something that should not be considered as dangerous uh, more readily than what used to happen. And, and we still, you know, people talk about the hygiene hypothesis, but, uh, you know, I, I still am waiting for, you know, a clear definition. And I think this, this may be many different types of mechanism, but there's certainly something about our Western culture. Um, and so people are starting to be more careful about not giving as many antibiotics in young children only when, you know, this is really required. So it's not given as easily as it used to be uh, because people are much more aware of the dangers of antibiotics. Uh, you know, the diet we have, 
uh, people are paying more and more attention. There are more and more studies trying to understand how how the diet can interfere. Um, it's thought you know that uh, being too clean is is also dangerous. So you have uh, you know studies in Amish and Hutterite people that have shown that the Amish have less asthma than the Hutterites. And one key difference is hatterites live much more in contact with the animals in the farm. The children, you know, are more uh, outdoors and the hatterites have a more, you know, the mango and do agriculture. It's very clean. Everything is separated. The animals are not in contact with people. So there's this notion in general of, uh, of the way we live that somehow uh, puts us at higher risk for these complex immune disorders. Uh, and so prevention, I think, includes all of that. And if really we come to the conclusion that certain viruses uh, put us at, uh, you know, put children, especially in family members with the predisposing HLA molecules at much higher risk, then one could ask the question, would it be worth vaccinating those children uh, against uh, the viruses that we know can predispose them and uh, and uh, and for children who are at risk. Now, concerning the treatment of celiac disease, there's a very strong interest from a pharma right now. And you have many different ways that pharma tries to tackle celiac disease. So some people want to uh, even prevent any reaction against gluten. So they uh, are using bacterial enzymes that can digest gluten in tiny peptides so that it cannot induce an immune response. You can have uh, people who want to interfere with the peptide binding to HLA molecules. Uh, so you, you have a whole series of approaches that want to prevent even gluten peptides of being presented to the immune system. Then you have a series of uh, therapies that are being developed with nanoparticles or what people call vaccines, where what they're trying to do is either delete the pathogenic pool of gluten T cells or redirect the pathogenic pool of gluten T cells towards uh, T cells that would be more uh, tolerogenic. Uh, and so there are many efforts that are done in that direction. Uh, I would say we, uh, you know, there are ongoing efforts and we have to wait uh, and see. Uh, but I, I would just stress that these efforts are going to encounter several difficulties. One is that they will have to target already tissue resident anti-gluten T cells that are embedded in the intestinal tissue and circulating cells. And they may respond to very different triggers and very different uh, mechanisms of uh, regulation. So you would have to target both. Secondly, uh, if you are not inducing a dominant regulatory immune response, even if you leave a little bit of those cells, they can re-expand. So it means we, we also have somehow to induce immune cells that can block the pathogenic responses. And how we do that and how it works uh, still remains to be uh, defined. And then they are not, as you know, just one gluten peptide. There are many gluten peptides. So how can you ensure tolerance towards all gluten peptides that uh, have the ability to engage the immune system. But this is an effort that's underway. And I think there are uh, chances that this may work, but uh, it may require a combination of approaches. And then there are other approaches that don't try even to regulate the anti-gluten immune response. They are thinking more about how do you block tissue destruction? So how do you just block uh, uh, villus atrophy. So, uh, and we know that this is more mediated by effector cells that we call cytotoxic T cells. And, you know, our group has shown that it involves a number of innate molecules like IL-15 and K receptors and other innate molecules. So can you interfere with uh, this part without touching even the anti-gluten immune response? So again, there are a number of pharmaceutical companies that are interested in, in, in that approach. So I think where celiac disease is very interesting is because we know that the, the disease-driving antigen, we know the HLA molecule, we can actually really study and understand how those therapeutic approaches may work 
And then the lessons learned there could be applied to other diseases. Are there currently any studies so, or is it available? You mentioned trying to reduce the, the damage, the, react, the, the response exists. Uh, I know that for other autoimmune disorders, there's some antibodies targeting uh, chemo, uh, cytokines or chemokines, things like that. That does, does that make sense in the context of celiac disease um, to try well, no, biological monoclonal antibodies or things like that? Yeah, actually, there there are you know there was an attempt with anti IL fifteen mm -hmm. uh, for people who don't respond to gluten free diets, so for uh, what we call refractory sprue, uh, where anti IL fifteen antibodies were attempted. Uh, th there was some signals. This is a rare disease, uh, and and there's still an ongoing trial. Uh, so uh, looking at that cytokine, but it is likely that just targeting this cytokine may not be sufficient because when you really have overt celiac disease, you have a number of cytokines that can interact and, and, and there's certainly a level of redundancy. Uh, there are other companies who are aiming at targeting multiple cytokines at the same time that are involved in celiac disease, like IL-15 and IL-21 at the same time. So I think you know, in celiac disease, because it's not like type 1 diabetes or uh, IBD, it's considered that the gluten-free diet can be considered a treatment. So the, the bar for accepting a therapy is much higher. And so uh, that's why, you know, there are, there are certainly more hesitations. But I think we are evolving right now because people are acknowledging more and more uh, the fact that a gluten-free diet, uh, you know, can have an impact on the social life and the well-being of people. Um, there are many patients when they have gluten contamination that uh, feel the effects for several days after gluten contamination. And so... Uh, you know, the idea is emerging more and more that we may want to have actually alternative treatments for celiac disease. So yes, targeting cytokines could certainly be a way uh, of uh, addressing the disease, maybe targeting B cells, maybe another way. Um, I would say we are just at the beginning of, of this adventure and also a change in the culture of how we view celiac disease and, and the gluten-free diet. So I'm going to shift gears a little bit and talk about my most favorite thing, which is the microbiome, um, for obvious reasons. Uh, you've looked at this quite a bit. I think you've everyone looks at it in the context of IBD. I'm going to put that aside for a second. You've also done some interesting work. There's this TET2 story. You've looked at uh, this bifidobacter in cancer. Could, could you give it a high level? And maybe take it outside of colon cancer, right? Like we we kind of understand that bacteria in the colon can affect colon cancer because they're there, right? It's kind of highly proximal, so not very important, but not as surprising. Sorry, my old PI, Christian Jobin, very important, yes, but not not a, not surprising it could do that. But you're finding all types of other stuff bacteria are doing. They're influencing cancer. I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit because I think it's fascinating just how much of an effect the microbiome is having on other cancers? Honestly, I don't know how much we have actually evidence that systemically uh, the microbiota can drive colon cancer. I think there's more evidence that the microbiota could modulate the immune response or the anti-cancer immune response or the, or, or the response to checkpoint inhibitors, for example. Um, so, you know, if you, if you take a germ-free mice that doesn't have a microbiota, you can immediately see that the immune system of those mice is profoundly altered. They, they don't have the same level of baseline uh, immune activation. There are certain cytokines that are lower. There are certain subsets of immune cells that are missing, uh, especially in tissues. So there is very clearly an impact of the microbiota, not just on the local intestinal immune system, but on the systemic immune system. That, that, that I think nobody would discuss that. Uh, we, we also know that, you know, for example, in, uh, in mice, but this is happening uh, very likely in human, that uh, early on in life, especially after weaning in mice, you have bacterial translocations. So there are bacteria that go systemically 
and uh, that are going to inform the, the, the systemic immune system uh, in some ways. So, and then there are all the metabolites that are being produced by the microbiota that can also affect the immune system. So th there is very clearly a, a much more general impact of the microbiota on uh, the immune system. But then I think one has to separate um, the question into what are the cases where the microbiota may play a direct role in promoting a disease, like people think that the microbiota can play a role in inflammatory bowel disease directly. Uh, so when you know you re derive the stools to the skin, uh, patients get better. Uh, when you know in some cases you you treat with antibiotics, they may get better. So in some diseases, you can say probably the microbiota is directly in some ways a culprit. But even in those cases, like IBD, and Jason knows that very well, people have a very hard time identifying the bad bacteria uh, that uh, you know causes the disease. And, and I, I would even argue, is there such one bad bacteria or is it more generally a dysregulated immune response uh, to the microbiota without it involving a particular uh, specific uh, pathogen? I will say we have learned that lesson and been working on it still where, where I work with microbiome therapeutics and it's very difficult. Yeah, it is very difficult. I can difficult. really say, but I can say based on our public trials, it's been, it's, it's hard to get it always to work. Yeah. And, and then you, you have uh, examples in, in colon cancer where people have identified locally the presence of certain bacteria that are known including because people have done ex uh, mechanistic experiments in mice, uh, you know, linking a, a specific bacteria to the development of colon cancer, where those bacteria have certain properties that can increase, let's say, uh, proliferation of epithelial cells, mutations, and uh, etc. So th there are situations where, you know, people can directly uh, somehow believe that the, the microbiota is like one of the driving uh, antigens or the, or the driver of a disease. And then you have all the diseases where we believe that the microbiota is one of the components that may modulate risk, that may modulate severity, and that may also modulate healing uh, of uh, damaged mucosa. And, and I think we have to clearly separate those two scenarios and think about them in, in different ways. Yeah, as always in this in this uh, podcast, the microbiota is more complex than we could have predicted. And do you think there is a, there's thinking for the future and for therapies? Could microbiome, like a, a specific microbiota, even engineer microbiota, could we use that to modulate, for example, cel maybe celiac disease is very extreme. And we know for IBD, but I don't know, could we have like an anti-inflammatory micro microbiota that we use for celiac patients or a microbiota that consumes all the gluten so fast that we don't even see it before? Uh, but uh, here, Brenda, you're giving two very distinct examples. I think the microbiota that could digest gluten more rapidly, people are already doing it by uh, these clinical trials where they're taking bacterial enzymes that are, for instance, capable of uh, digesting gluten peptides even where prolines are because the enzymes we have are very poor digesters of peptides that are rich in prolines, whereas some microbial enzymes do that very well. So people are already doing it, and there's work from Elena Verdu in Canada and others where they uh, you know, show that uh, depending on the nature of the microbiota, the enzymatic potential is different, and that this can impact uh, on how many gluten peptides are available. So you know, th that's for certain. Now, could you uh, use the microbiota to modulate the immune response? I think that's where it becomes much more complicated and, and much more difficult. Um, I think that uh, we need, that's why we need to phenotype and understand much better, not just bacterial composition, and people are more and more aware 
of that, that you need to go at the level of bacterial strains, you need to know the exact genes that are present, uh, and, and you need to start uh, thinking about a functional uh, potential of the microbiota. And there, I think, with that knowledge and you know, with the, a better knowledge of different diseases, one could start thinking about much more specific interventions. But there still needs to be more work done in that area. So, so it sounds like you're a big advocate of whole genome sequencing over 16S, which I would uh, yeah. agree with. Yeah. And so, I think we need also to go towards bacterial cultures. We, we need to go about uh, you know understanding the different genes and, and what they do. Many of the genes that are present in bacteria, we don't even know what they do. We focus on uh, the bacterial microbiome, but there's the virome uh, you know, that we don't take uh, still enough into account. So we, we still have a way to go, but I think we are learning more and more and we are certainly you know, coming now to a phase where we are much more mature about how we think about the microbiome and uh, about which approaches need to be taken uh, to, you know, to go to go towards a better understanding, but also potential clinical trials. So, putting aside the microbiome as a frontier in mucosal immunology, what do you think another frontier or area is that we're going to see? You know, I'm also a clinician. Clinical movement on in the next ten years. Where do you think? Where do you think that other frontier will be? I think that for me, one of the key next frontiers, you know, many people have said, oh, you know, we have now discovered TCRs, we have discovered all the key genes, we have discovered all the key molecules, what is there to discover? And my response is always, do, uh, do we know how to treat or prevent cancer? Do we know how to treat autoimmune disorders? You know, and the answer is no. So it means there's still we much we don't understand. And I think the big next frontier is not to think in immunology terms, microbiology terms, genetic terms, neurodevelopment terms, but is to think in terms of a system to understand that any disease uh, or any situation is uh, tissue cells interacting, like epithelial cells interacting with the nervous system, interacting with the immune system, interacting with the microbiota, interacting with endothelial cells. So I think the big, big next challenge is to have a much more systems approach, but without being lost in big data, uh, but being able to integrate uh, all all this expertise and all the data we can generate in this integrated manner to generate models and hypotheses that then we can test at the functional level. But I, I, I think this is to me really the best, uh, the big next frontier. Well, with on that high note for the future, mm -hmm. we are reaching the end of our conversation and mm -hmm. it was very, very interesting uh, talking to you. And I'm looking forward to see how the field how our understanding of celiac disease and other inflammatory diseases uh, changes and evolves. Mm -hmm. But before we go, uh, we would like to ask you a question not related to your research necessarily, uh, so for our listeners to get to know you a little bit better. So our question to you is, what is the biggest misconception about science that you would like to correct? I think it's a little bit about the danger we are in right now is that we think that the only way to really advance science is to do very applied translational science, science targeted towards specific questions. Treat uh, you know, celiac disease, treat type 1 diabetes, uh, prevent COVID uh, uh, infections. But what we should remember is that all the main discoveries have come from free science from investigators just being curious and investigating questions and sometimes uh, you know going after ideas that were deemed at the time as crazy ideas and those ideas have then led to basic discoveries that now we are using in very practical ways to change disease uh, you know, CAR T cell therapy comes from signaling and analyzing T cell receptors. But when this was designed, it was not with the thought in mind of designing CAR T cell therapy. 
uh, when uh, people, and I'm using examples for cancer here, checkpoint inhibitors. This was about understanding how the immune system is regulated. So I think we, we have to step back from this obsession of only applied science and uh, acknowledge and recognize the value of fundamental science and free science. And, and, and so, uh, you know, leaving to the individual and the creativity of the individual, uh, the ability to go after questions, uh, you know, the vaccine on uh, RNA vaccine was not done to treat coronavirus, you know, again, it, uh, or CRISPR-Cas that is be now being used. It was done by people who are passionate about how bacteria defend the cells uh, against viral infection. So, uh, it is very important to keep that part of science alive and to acknowledge it and to be patient and to understand that sometimes a discovery made, you know, 50 years earlier will all of a sudden find its way in a very major way uh, in uh, clinical applications. I think that's a very wise approach. And I would just like to thank you again for coming on. You and I could probably talk for four or five hours. For sure. <laughs> Thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. That brings us to the end of our show. Don't forget to subscribe to our newsletter at www.immunologypodcast.com to get show notes, including an episode summary and links to all of the interview and roundup papers. You can also reach out to us on Twitter at Immunopodcast or via email at info at immunologypodcast.com if you have feedback or you would like to suggest a guest. See you next time.